Welcome to Leading the Next Generation with Tim Elmore. I'm your co-host, Andrew McPeak, and our mission here at Growing Leaders is to empower the emerging generations with skills to lead in real life. Well, welcome once again, podcast listeners. I'm here with Dr. Tim Elmore. How are you today, Tim? I'm very well. Good. I'm excited about our conversation today because I think it's a thing that we all know is really important, but you've got some language for us that we're going to be able to utilize today to remind ourselves of why it's so important to help young people yeah. get ready to add value in the workplace or in any context that they're yeah. in. So I'm excited yeah. about it. As they move from backpack to briefcase, I think a lot of kids in K-12 and even in college learn a little bit about what we're going to talk about, but they don't have handles for it. Yeah. And very often they can sabotage themselves in a job interview or whatever, just because they didn't learn this important thing called social capital. Mm. So Andrew, I want to reverse things for just a moment. Okay. Um, I think your story in many ways is an illustration of this. You started at Growing Leaders, what year was it? Was it was 2015. 2015, and you were 26? Is I that was 26 correct? years okay. old. Young yeah. whippersnapper. Yeah, you're... walking in, uh, shaking, nervous, and all still that Still wet stuff. behind the ears, still yeah. green as could be. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But Andrew, I really feel like your story is a great picture of what we're about to talk. You're a good example of how to build social capital. Yeah. So when we first met, tell me about where you were in your career. Yeah, so I was, I was pretty early on in 26, so I had a yeah. few years under my belt. I had come from a couple of experiences, but most of the things I had done that were relevant to growing leaders, I'd actually done freelance for yeah. friends and yeah. people I'd met along the way. And so uh, when I came in, we got introduced by a friend of a friend. Yeah. Um, and I, I had been a, an ad admirer of growing leaders and of your work for many years. And so uh, I came in, um, uh, asked for an interview, and we sort of sat down and, and connected. But that that first thing, I, I really all that I was bringing to the table was a couple of experiences, a little bit of experience, but a passion for what we did and an interest in being helpful in whatever way that I could be. Yeah. So. so I think I recognized in you both a helpful IQ, but also a savvy EQ. And that was equally important to me. We, yeah. we need smart people on the team, but we also need people that are people smart. So would you talk about some of the early steps you took? You're not bragging, but just talk about how, because you got moved along, moved along, moved along, given more responsibility, yeah. but you didn't demand it. You earned it. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, there were several places, you know, uh, um, in high school, I went to several different leadership uh, camps and other yeah. things like that and got uh, more responsibilities. And every time more responsibility was offered, I said, yes, let's see yeah. what, what that is. Um, I remember in, uh, in college, I applied to be a part of a student leadership group and was accepted as a freshman which wasn't very common, but yeah. they happened to have an opening. I happened yeah. to be friends with somebody who was on that yeah. leadership team. And they, so they happened to invite me to apply, you know, um, but all of those kind of opportunities is what they were. Some luck, right. Yeah. But also me making the most of luck. And yeah. so I did that then. Yeah. Um, when I originally moved to Atlanta, I was working for another nonprofit that did kind of like service learning yeah. um, opportunities. And that was another opportunity that somebody yeah. had sort of taken a chance on me. So uh, yeah, all along the way, it was lots of little leadership opportunities. And for me, you know, I always point this out. It was great luck that I walked in that door that day yeah. to me, but there was another component to it, which was when you and I sat down and we talked about how you needed some content help and you went, do you happen to have a portfolio? I said, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the reason I could say yes was because I had been saying yes for yeah. the last five yeah. years or so. Every time somebody came to me and said, would you help me with, or would yeah. you yeah. Uh, help me build this? Or would you help me, um, you know, do this? And some of it I got paid for and some of it I didn't get paid for, yeah. but I did a good job of sort of collecting it. And so when I sat in front of you, I said, Hey, I'm 26. I don't have that many experiences, but here's what I have done. Yeah. And I think that sort of helped you see Oh, this guy's willing to put in the work. Yes, that's exactly right. So in the subsequent years, months, and then years, yeah. it was beyond 1099 income. We yeah. invited you to serve full time. But I want you to talk about how the needs of our organization matched some of the competencies you had. Again, you're not bragging, but I want, you're an illustration of what we're going to try to teach today yeah. on this podcast. Yeah. Well, so it started, as you said, 1099, the, the need of the hour was yes. Tim's really busy with writing yeah. and speaking and yeah. all those things, very much like you are today. But the difference was there was nobody really helping yeah. you. Maybe a few team members who were dropping their normal job and coming yeah. over to help you. And so the need of the hour was, hey, we need somebody. We can only really yeah. do 30 hours a week. Is that something you'd yeah. be looking? And I had to move some things around 
to make that work financially. But to me, it was worth doing yeah. that. That was the need of growing leaders at the moment. And that was the arrangement for the first yeah. nine months. I was yeah. 30 hours a week trying to make, you know, make it all work. And I think I earned an yeah. opportunity for more. And so at that nine month mark, um, Holly, our, our uh, yeah. VP at the time, welcomed me into our yeah. office and said, we want to take it to the next level. But the next level was another uh, meeting a need opportunity. Yeah, they right. wanted to found a new department. We called it program excellence, but it yeah. was a combination of the content I had been doing yeah. and customer service, yeah. which was a big need for the organization at the time. And that was not a background of mine, but I said, yeah. I'd love to meet that need, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and it was a major learning curve and we, we did a lot of great things. We learned a whole lot. Um, and the same thing happened a few years later when we uh, adapted moved out yeah. and created our, our yeah. uh, partner success department and then officially created a content department for the yeah. first time because that was the need of the hour. So yeah, there was certainly several stages along the way yeah. where it was, hey, Andrew, this is what we need. Can you help meet that need? And I was able to step in. Yeah. And I would say, as I look back on those years, you brought both uh, talent, but it was also your temperament. It was it was you were mature and there was social capital, not just talent capital. Yeah. Both both are capital. Yeah. So uh, and that's what we want to talk about today. How do you build in an emerging generation member uh, both both sides of this? And and that's again, this I think is a conversation we need to have with so many, maybe every young person yeah. Yeah. in every school, every youth group, every boys and girls club everywhere. Yeah. And, and to me, it's, um, I, I do, I feel like it needs an asterisk of saying I was who I was at 26 and beyond because of the people who had invested yeah, in me, yes. who taught me to be humble and taught yes. me to be gra gracious and all yeah. of those things. Yeah. And I think a lot, for a lot of kids, they don't have that person. Yeah, that's right. Nobody's teaching them, Hey, this is, this is what you, the way you add value. This is how to handle yourself, or this is why poise is so important or any of those kinds of things. And I think that's the problem that a lot of the leaders who might be listening to this podcast right now are yeah. thinking is it would be great if somebody like Andrew was always walking in. Yeah. And again, that's not bragging. That's saying uh, not yeah. everybody's getting developed like I got developed and I'm, I'm a yeah. product of that. So uh, you actually came across a story yeah. of a, a young lady named Megan, who in a lot of ways was sort of the other side of the story that we're talking about. For sure. Yeah. So Megan recently interviewed for a job on her college campus. She's an upperclassman. Uh, she's very talented and her GPA is among the highest in her class. Okay. Yet her interview prevented her from getting fired. I repeat, it didn't help her. It prevented <laughs> her from getting, want to hear that. from getting hired. Yeah. yeah. Megan replied to some questions in the interview in a way she assumed was confident, but was perceived as arrogant. Mm. There's a fine line there. There is. Yeah. And while every employer loves to see confidence in young people, emerging generations can lack self-awareness, not always, but sometimes, and don't recognize one key to succeeding in their career. And that key I'm speaking of is this major topic today, social capital. Absolutely. Social capital can be the difference between sounding arrogant and sounding confident, right? Absolutely. If you've earned it with somebody, then that totally yeah. changes how your words sound. Yeah. So in our younger years, each of us must both earn and learn. I love that. Okay. We must learn how to how, how jobs and careers work so you're in a learning mode. You're, you're contributing, but you're also observant, okay? So... We're learning how jobs and careers are working, how gaining influence works, and ultimately how life works. We do this as we earn both capital and social capital. Yeah, well said. Both are important. We, we want to earn money for sure. Absolutely. We can't live, live or, you know, put food on the table. Yeah. But social capital, I would say, is just as important and may proceed. Yeah. Because if you brought social capital before we paid you enough <laughs> to feed your wife. My social capital that, that, earned my capital. That's exactly yeah. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. If only I spoke for a living. Okay. <laughs> uh, when we fail to navigate relationships well, we can reach an impasse and misunderstand why. Uh, so let me share a pattern that I've observed recently. And, and folks, listeners, I'm about to give you a hopefully a clear definition of what I mean when I say social capital. Love it. Um, today, emerging generations, that will be Generation Z, millennials, and even Alpha Gen uh, coming along before, behind Gen Z, they feel the agency that social media platforms offer them. Yeah. We do. It's kind of awesome. Yeah. All right? Uh, their posts can gain lots of views, likes, followers, and shares. And this can create an artificial sense of their value. Mm -hmm. uh, they can later interact in a job interview, for instance, as if they have lots of social capital, when in fact they may have very little and zero with the boss. Yeah. yeah. Now, maybe he or she should know more about 
you're an influencer yeah, on social media. You clearly media. haven't been on my TikTok. That's you know? right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Yes. <laughs> so social capital is like relational currency. Can I say that again? Social capital is like relational currency that we spend to acquire what we want from others. Okay, nothing wrong with this. It's not a manipulation. It's just how you earn influence in the lives of others. Most of us possess some street cred. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've had some past in our life. Call it pocket change. We'll talk about pocket change in just a little bit. Yep. At work, we accumulate more as we add value to other, uh, where we solve problems for others and we serve others. Okay, yes. this is all about earning the social capital. May have little to do with. Um, how much money I'm making, or the title I have yeah. has everything to do with how I'm mixing it up with, with people on the job. So summary, in short, when we display value, we become valuable in the sight of people. Yeah. It's almost like they paid you metaphorical money and said, good job on that. Yes. Hold on to this $10 right. bill or whatever. They put change in your pocket. It's Absolutely. emotional change. Yeah. It's social change. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's street cred. It's yeah. credibility that you get when you make a good decision. Yeah. Okay, so this makes it easier for others to say yes to our request. Yeah. In other words, you put get change in your pocket. You can spend a little bit sometime when you need something. So you can say, it's, would you do me a favor, or would you mind introducing me to that's right. or one of those other things? And that's why I love the word capital. It's money. Yeah, but it's emotional money, social money. It's it's invisible money, okay? Yeah. And too often today, people can expect special treatment or positive responses from others when they've not earned it. In fact, their pockets may be almost empty. Yeah. That happens. But they're they're acting like they're big spenders. It's yeah. almost like they're using the social credit card rather than the social <laughs> That's a capital. great, yeah. I got no capital in the bank, but would you do this for me? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, it is very interesting. It's such a great metaphor. And I think people are right now thinking about somebody who has asked them to do something and they're thinking, this person has no capital yeah. with me. And we run into that all the time. Well, you've got some other great examples uh, for us that I want to dig into in just a minute. But before we do that, let's take a quick break, uh, talk about a resource, and then we'll be right back. Hey guys, Andrew here. I'd like to talk to you about our curriculum, Habitudes for Social and Emotional Learning. Growing up in a post-pandemic world means that many students today are facing new challenges and often don't have the social and emotional skills to handle it all. When students possess skills like self-awareness, impulse control, empathy, teamwork, and responsible decision-making, they're prepared to not only survive, but succeed inside and outside of the classroom. Habitudes for Social and Emotional Learning comes in both middle school and high school versions and presents a fun, image-based pedagogy designed to delight and challenge your students. Find out more about how you can get Habitudes for Social and Emotional Learning to your school by going to growingleaders.com slash SEL. All right, Tim, you were just talking with us about this idea of social capital. You defined it for us, but I'd like for you to start to kind of help us apply what we're talking yeah, about here. Yeah. So let's talk about growing social capital. Um, like all young team members, Generation Z employees will gain a realistic perspective when they understand the principle of incentives. Mm. Everybody has incentive to behave the way they do. And by the way, if they have incentive, but they don't act like it, it can be horrible. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a good example. Pam and I just noticed this last week, if I'm just can be blunt here for a moment, horrible customer service in retail outlets. Yeah. Okay. Just horrible. Yeah. Now, maybe the clerk was 21 and having a really bad day, but we're thinking, wait, I want to give you money. Yeah. Please make it easier for me to give you money. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. They don't realize that clerk didn't realize, oh, I have every incentive. Because you know this money you're about to give me is going to help pay my salary. Yeah, I probably sound like your grandpa right now, but but I I just <laughs> just a little bit. But I only had that conversation that, once. So. <laughs> you put up with me, don't yeah. you? So I feel like we've got to talk about incentives. Who's got incentive? Yeah. Now, in a perfect world, we all have incentive to love and care for each other and talk nice. But unfortunately, we don't love, care, and talk nice all the time. Yeah. We we don't. We've got to understand this. Every transaction with others is catalyzed by incentives. In short, who has the greatest incentive to make this exchange work? Uh, I'll give you a good example. I just met with a marvelous couple today who came from South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, they stopped in Atlanta. They're on their way to see their son, but they made a stop. Um, that showed me they had a lot of incentive to show up here. So yeah. we, we met for breakfast. It was a marvelous time. If you're listening, great to be with you guys. Yeah, yeah Bradley and, and Barb. But anyway, 
Uh, here's my point. They showed great incentive. They leaned way in yeah. to meet and show, it just made me want to lean in yeah. right they back. They put major change in your pockets. Yeah. We went out of our way to do this. Absolutely. So consider when we purchase products in stores. If the seller wants to sell her product more than the buyer wants to buy it, the seller will likely lean in and make, make the offer sweeter. Yeah. Maybe they drop the price. I don't know. But they do something that lets them know, I really want this I to want work. I want this to happen. Yeah. So it's all about levels of motivation. Yeah. To me, what's really interesting that you're bringing up here is if, if it is truly about incentive, and I think you're 100% right, I wonder if sometimes part of the challenge with young people is they don't understand yeah. what's in it for them, right? Yes. So much of the time, they're thinking so short term yeah. rather than long term. Yeah. They don't see the benefits of yeah. Why would I go out of my way to do that for somebody else? So it's like, think about what how this yeah. is going to one day return to you yeah. or what what pocket change you're going to be earning mm -hmm. by by investing in this person or doing this favor or adding this value. Yeah. We're often not thinking about that. I think you're right. And I think sometimes young people don't. I'm just thinking about conversations I've had because they think you're just telling me to do something to get something back. Yeah. Well, we're not saying that. Yeah. We're not saying manipulate a person so you get the car or whatever. Yeah. We are saying though, keep adding value, keep adding value. Trust me, it will reciprocate. It will echo back to you. At some point in the future, you will be very glad you That's did right. that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So consider this proposition for gaining social capital. I'm about to give you a sentence, listeners, that, um, that I want you to lock into, okay? Social capital increases based on providing the scarcest resource. Yeah. Social capital increases based on providing the scarcest resource. So when a team member who may or may not be in a leadership position possesses capabilities or qualities or skills that others don't have, they accumulate social capital. Quite quickly. Yes, that's exactly right. They earn influence. Their growing authority has nothing to do with a badge or a title. And I would say some basic rules for building social capital are these. One, I've already said it, but add value. When we solve problems and serve people, we value people and we add value. Mm. Two, deposits earn withdrawals, just yeah. like a bank, okay? Yeah. I can't make a withdrawal unless I put money in there first. So we have to give to others before expecting return. Just think that way. Yeah. And then three, give it time. Mm. You plant a seed and the plant doesn't come up the next day. And, and this is silly, but we just need to give it time. Yeah. Social capital use doesn't, usually doesn't surface overnight, but over time. But those are huge. Can I give a, perhaps it's a silly example, but yeah. to me it's so tangible because I love this idea of, of providing the scarcest resource. So a few years ago, we were hosting a training here in our office and we had a guy who flew in to, to join the training. Well, we found out when he arrived on the early morning, it was 8 a.m. start time for us. We found out that his plane had been delayed and he didn't get into Atlanta until, oh. I mean, it was super late, 2 yeah. a.m., something like that. So he's arriving. We can tell he's kind of groggy. He's telling us the story. Story. And I was like, can I get you a cup of coffee or something? And he said, no, I don't really drink coffee, but man, do you guys happen to have a Dr. Pepper? Yeah. Well, so I go look in the fridge. We don't have any Dr. Yeah. Pepper, but I thought I don't have to tell him that. Right. Yeah. So we sent one of our team members out yeah. who bought a case of Dr. Pepper, put it in the fridge and yep. we were just like, you know, almost force feeding him Dr. Pepper all day. That man sang our praises. Yeah. We could have done with the training could have been the worst training in the world. And he would have said, this is the best thing I've ever been to. But that's what we did is we yeah. provided the scarcest resource. Yeah. And I think if we would think about not think about the value we're adding, yeah. not by based on who we are, but based on what people need, yes. it would totally transform the value that we're adding. That's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. So that day, our trainee didn't keep him awake. The caffeine. That's exactly right. I'm just saying. I'm we were aware saying. of it. That's, that's okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Andrew, if you don't mind, yes. uh, I want to land the plane here by sharing four metaphors that really illuminate this issue. I'd love that. And listeners, if you're listening because you care about the next generation, these might be conversation starters. Pictures are worth a thousand words. Indeed. So let us just um, share some of these, these images. Uh, we call them habitudes. Many of you are listening will, are totally aware of habitudes, but they're images that form leadership habits and attitudes. That's why we call them habitudes. So I want to reflect on a few of them here that could spark learning, teaching, conversation, and discovery. Especially on this issue. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So the first one is actually from Habitudes for New Professionals, mm -hmm. that resource. But we simply call it Coffee Step. Yep. Coffee Step. So Carrie Priest, a dear friend, she's a prof at Kansas State right now, but she was first year out of, out of college when she started with, with, with us, and I was helping to give oversight to Carrie. And Carrie told me more recently, Tim, I remember my first year there, 
you all asked me to get the coffee for the meetings. And she said, at first, I was kind of put off by that. Yeah. She said, are you asking? She didn't say it, but she thought it. She said, are you asking me? Because I'm a girl. Yeah. And the guys won't do this. Or yeah. were you asking me? And you didn't realize I have a bachelor's degree. Yeah. You know, blah, 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 I'm blah. I'm the youngest person or yeah, whatever. That's but right. you don't know how much I can offer. Yeah. So she said, I'm so glad I bit my lip and I got the coffee. She said, you know the lesson I learned? I said, what? She goes, it got me in the room with the executives. Mm -hmm. I was pouring coffee, making coffee. She said, I'm meeting the VPs and, and, and other managers and executives. And pretty soon they're asking me questions. Next thing I know, they're asking me to sit down. Next thing I know, I'm at the table in the discussion, making a, making a cup of coffee, even though it's stupid, silly and small was actually the very step she needed to take to get where she wanted to go. So no one likes being asked to make the coffee, but when we're asked to do a small task and come through on them, we earn the right to speak into, into more. Uh, early tasks are not about talent, but about trust. Mm, Can I say that again? Please do. Early tasks that you give young people are not about talent. Well, I knew Carrie could do more than get coffee. Of My course, goodness gracious. Yeah. She had a bachelor's degree. Yeah. But they're about trust. Can I trust you to do a little thing? Okay, I can. Yeah. Good. I want to give you a bigger thing. So um, we earn the right. We just earn the right. We're earning trust. The coffee make leads to the big break. Love it. You, you like what I did there? Yeah, I okay. love that. All right. Yeah. The second metaphor is one that we all know, but it's one of our habitudes. It's simply called trade-offs. Trade-offs. So every decision we make is a trade-off. Doing one thing means you can't do another. Leaders can do anything, but they can't do everything. Truth. So in deciding, thank you for affirming that. I do appreciate I that. I feel that deep in my bones, Tim. <laughs> yes, you've been you've been an example of that, yes. trying to do all so, so many things around here. Okay, so in deciding what you're going to do, you need to choose, and you automatically will choose what you will not do. Yeah. I think wise leaders and even wise young professionals recognize the social capital they exchange on every decision they make, and they spend their time wisely, just like they spend their money wisely. Yep. They spend their time just as wisely. Every interaction, think about this, every interaction is currency earned or spent. Mm. And sometimes both. Yeah. Sometimes you both give each other a little currency. Absolutely. Okay? That's a win-win. We call that a win-win. Absolutely. But just, I'm just saying, listeners, talk about trade-offs and talk about the currency that's exchanged in every decision. It's such a great habit, I love that one. It's so simple, but it's just such yeah. a great reminder of every decision you make, you're also making a decision about what you're not gonna do. And I think young people understanding the implications of that, especially long-term, yeah. is so important. It is, yeah. So the third habit or third image is one we just mentioned earlier, pocket change. So let's elaborate just real quick. We earn credibility with others by displaying integrity, by cultivating relationships, and making good decisions, okay? That's how you get credibility. Yep. I see that you're making good decisions, Andrew. That's what I did back in 27. Uh, I see you uh, good with people. Everything you were doing, well, you might say it wasn't everything, Tim, but I felt like everything I saw you do, this was really good. And you're only in your 20s. This is amazing. You're ahead of your time. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And I wanted to reward that. As, I don't mean to sound patronizing. You were a team member. You're not under, but I just wanted to affirm and reward that. Yeah. And you earned your way. You're one of the most influential people on our entire employee list, but you earned it. You, did, you didn't get it granted through some sort of gift. Mm -hmm. It was earned. So pocket change is what you built. You got emotional change put in your pocket and it enhanced your influence. And once again, it's social capital. And if leaders fail to do this, or if young team members fail, to do this, they lose the change in their pocket with people. Some people, quite frankly, have a hole in their pocket. Yeah. They don't realize they're losing all Everywhere kinds. Everywhere they go, yeah. That's right. In fact, the bad decisions, they have no idea that it was taken wrong, and now the people don't want to give them that gift. They don't want to give them that promotion. They don't want to give them that break yeah. or that introduction. I can't trust you with that introduction to yeah. my good friend. Yeah. So this is huge. Leaders are constantly filling or emptying their pockets. That's pocket change. Absolutely. One last one. Please I know come. I'm waxing eloquent here, but this last one may be the most important of all because it so illustrates what we're talking about. It's a habit you and I have talked about through the years. It's called tightrope walker. Mm. Tightrope walker. So folks listening, I know you may not be seeing anything. You may just be hearing something, but I want you to picture somebody walking across a tightrope, okay? Something that most people can't do. Yeah. In fact, for everyone that can, millions cannot. I was going to say, I can't. So yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't either. Except in my dreams. Yeah. So it's easy to watch 
a tightrope walker. Harder to do it, easier to watch, okay? Yeah. In fact, I, I, I think of tightrope walker stories where people are applauding on the cliffs of the Niagara Falls as he walks back and forth. Oh my gosh, OMG, this is amazing, okay? Easy to watch. It's a whole nother thing when the tight walker steps off the tight walker and says, anybody want to climb on my back? Uh, no. Yeah, I'm just here for, so, yeah. for viewing. <laughs> Thank right. you. Exactly. So it's harder because at that point when he asks that question, he's asking you to trust him to climb on his back or yeah. her back. Yeah. Our world today is full of people who don't trust others. Mm -hmm. They would say, yeah, I like the show. I'm not going to climb on your back. Yeah. So it's easy to be liked as a friend, but not followed as a leader. Yeah. I learned that early on in my career. So good leaders build trust through competence, connection, and character. And I think the real way you learn if people trust you is you say, you willing to get on my back as I walk this tightrope? Okay, if they say yes, oh my gosh, what an incredible tribute that is yep. to, your, to their They're trust. They're willing to your... stake themselves and their mm -hmm. reputation on your performance. That is the essence of trust, if there it ever It really was. is, yeah. So leaders listening. You're a little bit like a tightrope walker. Mm -hmm. People can say they love you. They could put a little like on your social media feed. But the real test is, I'm willing to climb on your back and, and yeah. go on this journey. Uh, and now that work norms are being established after the pandemic, it's critical for younger generations to build some of the social capital we've been talking about on their teams. And I think it's time to let them do it. I love that. I love that. I love those habitudes. I think they're such great metaphors. I really want to encourage our listeners, uh, utilize these in conversations yeah. and just say, hey, it's about pocket change. Hey, it's about uh, a coffee step. It's about whatever this uh, metaphor is that it's very, very, very helpful. So I want you to close with a story, Andrew. Okay. Um, you back in college, I think this was, you had a story where you saw somebody earn social capital, might have been the least likely yeah. guy in the room. Talk about Matthew. Well, this is, you know, when I referenced the experiences I've had that helped make me the person I was when I walked at 26, this was one of my strongest leadership memories that happened way back in high school for me. Uh, I attended a leadership conference. There were about 60, 80 of us, depending on the year that were there as a part of the conference. It lasted three weeks. So wow. we got to know each other yeah. really, really well. Um, and over the course of the time, you know, you get to see who are some of the most outstanding leaders. And at the end, they give out two awards. Mm -hmm. They give out an award for the, uh, it's kind of the popularity award. Yeah, so every, yeah. all the <laughs> yeah. participants vote on who they think the best leader yeah, is, right? Yeah. And then a second is, award is given by the staff of oh. the leadership conference. So the adults who are there yep. in the room and yep. they give out a most outstanding leader award. It's always interesting. Uh, about 50% of the time it was the same person, okay. but sometimes it was different people. Yeah. And I remember vividly, I believe it was my third year doing this program um, that the, you know, the popularity award is given out lots of applauses and it's what, who everybody thought it was and all of that. And then the, uh, the leaders stand up to give out the second award and they call a name that I, I guarantee you most of the participating students in that room would have put him near the bottom of their list. Yeah. They had no idea. They all thought, oh, he's a great kid. You know, his, his name is Matthew. Yeah. He's a great kid, but who would call him an outstanding yeah. leader? Well, they call his name. He comes up. Yeah. And they could kind of see the puzzled looks on everybody's faces. And they go, we want to tell you what Matthew's been doing. Yeah. While the rest of you were doing this and that and this and that, here's what Matthew's been doing. He showed up early to every single event. Mm -hmm. He was there to set up chairs. He was, uh, you know, attaching lanyards to things and yeah. he was meeting different needs. He was setting up meals. He was cleaning up after everybody. He was behind the scenes solving yep. problems that the rest of you didn't even know about because you didn't show up that early. Yeah. And he had done that so consistently for three weeks that they would say, it has been so rare mm -hmm. that we've seen a, this yeah. profound of a leadership example. In other words, he was what we talk about all the yeah. time. He was a servant leader. Yeah. He was behind the scenes asking, what is is the greatest need of the hour and meeting that need. And I will never forget that moment because what I realized is he was a picture of what true leadership actually yeah. is. It's not about who can stand up and sound really great. It's not about who everybody thinks is the most powerful person in the room. It is about meeting the need of the hour. Mm -hmm. And every one of the adults had no qualms saying that's the best leader in yeah. the room because he had added, I think ultimately he had added change in all of their pockets. He'd also been adding change in our pockets and we didn't even know it. That's right. Yeah. That's well, and I love for that time, Matthew had the scarcest resource, which was his time and energy. Yeah. Nobody realized that should be scarce. There should have been 50 kids showing up for that. Yeah. But Matthew did scarce resource, social capital.
It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, uh, Tim, thank you so much for this yeah, conversation. Thank you. thank you guys for listening. And I want to tell you about two resources. If you're thinking about how to invest in the young leaders around you, I want to kind of give you two resources based on the context that you're in. So Tim mentioned one of our resources called Habitudes for New Professionals. That resource was designed specifically for those who are hiring a lot of young professionals or perhaps who have an internship program or some other kind of professional or workplace context. If you're in that context and looking for ways to have conversations like this, I would strongly encourage Habitudes for New Professionals to you. In fact, included in it are two of the images we talked about, the coffee step and pocket change, I believe, are both in that resource. And so those could be great ways for you to have conversations about what does it take to earn influence in the workplace, no matter what your context is. So if you want to pick that up, go to growingleaders.com, click on the store button, and you'll be able to pick up a copy or perhaps a couple of copies of Habitudes for New Professionals and have some great conversations about life skills in the workplace. If you're in a school context and wanting to build similar life skills, the ones we've been talking about, our Habitudes for Social and Emotional Learning program is a perfect fit to build a program that helps build these soft skills so students don't have to wait until they get to their career to yeah. begin living out some of these principles. So again, to find out more about Habitudes for Social and Emotional Learning, go to growingleaders.com slash SEL. We'd love for you to check that out. Well, as always, if you would rate this podcast, give us five stars on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts, we would greatly appreciate it. If you found this particularly helpful, we would invite you to share it with a friend or a colleague. We would greatly appreciate that. If you want to connect with us online, we are at Growing Leaders and at Tim Elmore pretty much everywhere you are. And then finally, if you have ideas for this podcast, whether it's somebody you think we should interview or a topic you think we should cover, shoot us an email. It's podcast at growingleaders.com. We love getting those. Tim, thank you once again for inspiring us in this conversation. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time.